Anyway, thanks everyone for coming tonight or coming to your living rooms and turning your computers on. Um, this seminar is called To Be or Not To Be Keith. What are your options? And we have Adam Ebert online and hopefully on audio soon. And he's gonna talk about um, Ebert Honey Company and, and how he works with farmers and other landowners and keeping bees on their farms. And then we have Susan Yario and Cheryl Damon also online. And uh, they have um, Adam's bees at their farm and um, they're gonna talk a little bit about their experience doing that. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Practical Farmers of Iowa since I have a captive audience here. Uh, we have this farm in our series, which hopefully many of you know about. We are most of the way through the fall farm in our series. And then we'll have a, well, we, we call a winter farm in our series that goes from essentially February through March or April. So we'll be putting that list of farm in ours out in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for that. Um, Practical Farmers of Iowa was founded in 1985 as sort of a ridge tillers club. It's a farmer led organization and has uh, programming in horticulture, field crops, and livestock. We also do a lot of work with beginning farmers. Um, we, our, our mission is strengthening farms and communities through farmer led investigation and information sharing. We just finished up our cooperators meeting on farm research is a, a big part of that. So we're all pretty jazzed about that component. Um, if you'd like to know more about PFI, you know, feel free to check out the website, uh, you know, call the office and we can uh, help you find a PFI member in your area who might like to meet you and talk a little bit more about you know, what they like about PFI. Um, if you want to join, it's pretty inexpensive, 50 bucks a year or 60 bucks for a whole farm. And one great reason to join along with others, I mean, all of our events are basically free. We have over hundred every year, but the annual conference um, does cost some money, but being a member gives you a great discount on that. And that in itself is worth being a member for. Also, you get the newsletter delivered to your house. Uh, you get to be on the email discussion list. Um, and sort of just more in the loop about all the stuff that's going on. Like I said, upcoming events, we keep an, a calendar of events on our website. We keep our events on there as well as other events that you might be interested in related to agriculture. Um, so do check that out. And as I said, we have uh, Mapping Our Future is our annual conference coming up um, January 23rd and 24th. Uh, it's going to be a great um, set of events, including the Play Map of My Kingdom. Um, so I'd encourage you guys to get on the website and check that out, or we can mail you um, a flyer about, about that. So that's, uh, oh, we do have some farm in our rules. I always forget this. Um, I'm going to keep everyone's audio muted just so we don't get feedback issues. Um, but you can ask questions in the chat box. And um, Adam and Susan and Cheryl will have sort of an hour here to present, and then we'll take 30 minutes that are reserved for questions. So you can type them in um, while we're going here. And uh, you and, and also sort of you can save them at the end and ask them at the end, but um, I'm sure they'll be checking that chat box throughout too. So um, I'm getting that someone doesn't have a visual. Are you seeing the PowerPoint moving? You just not, since we're still working on Adam's audio here. So I'm gonna pull up your um, PowerPoint and go ahead and you should unmute your microphone now and I'll, I'll mute mine and let you take over for a few minutes here. Good evening. Hello. Um, Cheryl and I grow organic vegetables, hay, cut flowers and herbs in eastern Iowa, east central Iowa, um, two counties from Illinois. And we've been uh, growing about three years. Next season will be our fourth growing season. Yep. And uh, we've learned a lot, but from the very beginning, we went to a uh, field day at uh, Laura Abbey Hills farm and we're introduced to Adam and his bees and Cheryl and I thought that was a great idea called Adam and then next thing you know we had bees on the farm. Um, we put them up before we put up our high tunnel so we have a picture in the um, PowerPoint that has them before the high tunnel and I don't have one after, but we do have one that um, is when we were building it, you, if you squint really hard, you'll be able to see it. So um, we grow organically, we grow open pollinated, very few hybrids. Uh, we love the bees, except there's a certain time of the year that they like this one tree. What's the tree, Cheryl? 
Linden. The linden tree, yeah. When it blooms. When it blooms, they get a little rambunctious and we get stung a few times, so. Um, but that's the only real issue I think we've had about them. So our PowerPoint is really just the gist of um, how we see the benefit. Um, there, I don't know where that, there it is. If you look way back there, that is um, winter wrapped beehives back there. Kind of hard to see, but we checked with Adam um, when we were going to put up the high tunnel that, you know, how far did it need to be? Were they going to be okay with it? And that wasn't a problem for him. As long as there was room for him to drive back there and check on them and take care of them, um, there wasn't an issue. So they didn't bother us that fall and winter when we were building the high tunnel at all. Um, then this is just what the summer looked like with the sides raised and bees coming in and out. Um, we do have buckwheat and hay on the property. And we, um, these 12 acres of hay and how many gardens? We had three acres of garden. Mm -hmm. And that's on um, Cheryl and her husband's property in Springville. This year, this first year, we um, were fighting deer. So this year, this past season and the next season, um, everything that's um, munchable by deer will be in this deer fence. And bees can get in and out of deer fence easily. And this next season we'll have more cut flowers and we do do uh, other cover crops besides buckwheat. Um, we had some bees friend this year and last year and I don't know uh, really if it made a difference or not. I mean the bees loved it but it's hard to find it in bulk so and it's a, I'm trying to think of what it is, a phasalius. So I think that would be a legume, but I'm not quite sure. This is just a sample of some of our products this year. Um, Liz, I'm not sure where else you want us to go. Any ideas? Okay. I think we've got Adam's mic working now. Adam, go ahead and connect and see if that's working. I think I just randomly hit buttons and things started to work properly. So I'm not sure how to explain that, but I'm glad to be able to share here for a moment. <laughs> I was sitting here listening to parts of Susan and Cheryl's presentation, so, um, but yeah, uh, it is great to be able to present here with BFI and talk about hosting bees or potentially keeping your own bees. And uh, Cheryl, Susan, and I got brought together through this PFI field day at, Cheryl, at um, Susan Krause's place at Abbey Hills Farm here near Mount Vernon. And so um, it just feels like it's kind of full circle to share here today. And so I didn't hear absolutely everything as I was moving through trying to get this microphone to work, so apologies if I repeat. But um, overall, uh, I can just go through what I tend to go through as far as what people want to know as far as hosting bees and what I am interested in as a beekeeper when I am looking at properties or just talking with people who are interested, like Susan and Cheryl are kind of ideal in that they've got a pretty organic um, intention and setting, and so there's lots and lots of flowers that are in the area and some timber to supplement, and then you know what they're actually producing as well, so it all comes together in that way. But um, here in this introductory slide, 
uh, that I've got as far as RBs, and these are some that are down by Linville, which is near Grinnell. Those are supposed to represent our typical yard that we often have somewhere between uh, 12 and 24 bees, beehives per yard. And so there in the left-hand side, you see some colonies that are open with the bees exposed. And and uh, down the lower right hand, you see a individual bee on some red clover with colony covering some pollen. OK, so let's see. I can click on the right hand, and we'll move along. But basically, the way that I look at it is that, um, you know, as beekeepers and landowners, this is something that we do in order to, you know, mutually benefit one another. And so as far as a landowner hosting bees or keeping bees either one, uh, some of the benefits you get are very obviously to have pollinators. And if you are hosting bees, then the arrangement tends to be that you get a honey delivery every year. And so that's a positive side. And as the publicity surrounding the difficulties of keeping bees alive in the past several years, especially since about 2006, have come along, then I've actually had quite a number of people that say, uh, Adam, if you ever need a place to keep bees, uh, just let us know. I've got a place in mind. And it seems to be mostly about just this idea that, yeah, while there are landowners that really want pollinators, there are also people who just want to be helpful as far as keeping a lively beekeeping population going. And so uh, that's great. And then again, as you have bees on your property, to go to that last bullet that I've got listed at the moment, uh, you, you always have bees that wander around and get involved with something. And while it's true that, as Cheryl and Susan were saying, that there are certain times that you may see bees behaving differently, like they've got a particular linden or basswood tree that seems to attract them and at the same time get them excited, uh, yeah, you just see them around. And, and sometimes they harry you when you don't want. And sometimes they're just fun to watch. And it varies from time to time. And for the beekeeper side, um, we are really dependent on people who are interested in hosting bees for one reason or another, in that it doesn't take much space in order to have anywhere from one to 30 hives at a particular location, um, because you just need a place to pull in and place the hive. That is it. So it's usually a corner of a timber or a corner of a field or something like that. But you know, in my case, where I'm part of Ebert Honey and we've got about 50 locations. You know, we're not going to own 50 quarter acre sections somewhere or anything like that. And so we really need to cultivate relationships with people who are interested in bees for one reason or another in order to do what we do at all. And that's how we make our honey. And that's how we develop this network within the farming community, period. And so it's very symbiotic. And that's the way I look at it. I do like this particular picture I've got on this slide in that we've got this um, little worker bee on top of a frame. And she's carrying blue pollen, which isn't one of the more common types of pollen. And so it's just kind of funny to see her carrying this along. OK. And so but if you do agree to this sort of engagement, the usual arrangement is that Somewhere in the fall or winter, uh, anywhere between October and January is usually when a honey delivery comes along so that you can have the supply to carry you through a good part of a year. And in my case, I'm always open to if you run out of the honey that I deliver and you want a little bit more in order to you know, just have a local supply, I generally have no problem with that. Uh, it's one thing, of course, if you're ordering 24 ounces versus a five gallon bucket, so it's not all equal. But um, I. I just depend on the consumption and interest of the person when it comes to supplying that. But if you do have bees, I mean, here are my happy bees you know, having their cheers moment. And so if you're thinking about either keeping bees for yourself or hosting them, either one, one of the most common topics to need to go through is what resources are available for them. And something that a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that bees have primarily to have two things that they live on. One is the pollen, which is the protein and vitamin resource. And then it's good to have a water 
supply locally if possible, although they can get by without one. It just increases the odds that they dip into any bird bath or something, as I'll show pictures later on, if you do not have a water supply available nearby. And then here in the Midwest and Iowa, if there's some protection from heavy winds in winter, that is useful, usually in the form of a windbreak on the north or east sides. That can help them quite a bit. And so when people ask, uh, well, what do you look for? when you're thinking about having bees. I'm like, well, in my ideal situation, I've got uh, diverse sources of forage and protection for them. And so while not all of this is required by any means, if somebody's really wondering what I look for, then a little bit of pasture where some clover is growing, some timber to provide early pollen, a water source within a quarter mile or so, and then some windbreak, especially for the winter months, those are all useful things. But even as I say that, I mean, the reality is that I work with all kinds of people who want bees who do not have all of this in one location. So it's all negotiable, basically. Bees are pretty resilient, especially if you help them a little, if they're short on feed or, or something like that. I've got one person down by, well, there's a small town kind called Morse that most of you have never heard of near Solon, just north of Iowa City. And I've got one person who actually puts out a little waterer for my bees in her property with little um, pebbles. It's one of these gravity feed waterers, and it has stones for the bees to sit on while they drink because there's not a water source within short flying distance. So she is remarkably dedicated, and I appreciate it. But um, the bees themselves are also very resilient as far as being able to manage uh, just within the locality as well, and when you're providing a home for them anyway. And so if you do have bees on your property, whether hosting or keeping them, here are some basic concepts to keep in mind about how they behave in different seasons. And so it's especially on my mind right now, moving into winter, that bees don't usually come out unless it's about 45 degrees or so. And that was slightly different just a couple of days ago where it was only about 40 degrees, but it was really sunny. So a bunch of them still came out anyway, even though it wasn't that warm. And so about 45 degrees, if it's less than that, you can do whatever you want around the hives because the bees are not coming out if it's 30 degrees or lower for certain, and below 40 degrees for that matter. And then as you move forward, the spring is when they start to build up, and uh, particularly trees are able to provide a pollen source that provides the protein and vitamins that will get them raising new bees. But it's also a bit tricky because if they don't have good nectar supplies, honey supplies in the hive, then they can actually still starve uh, without those carbohydrates, even though there's a lot of pollen around coming from maples and willows, as I'll show later. And then summer, and this is where, uh, basically from in Iowa here, from late May through early August is where we hit most of our cycles of floral sources that provide the honey flow. Uh, overwhelmingly, it's July, and that is when the main honey crop comes in. And then we go through the processing and storage of that crop, in my case, in 55-gallon barrels, but in a lot of other cases, just individual jars or five-gallon buckets. And so July is really when the main flow often occurs, but it can be any time between early May and, and or late May, really, and early August when most of that comes in. And in the fall, it is just wildly divergent what happens. Sometimes there's a significant honey flow that's a major portion of the crop. And then other times, in these past two years especially, uh, it can just be a dearth, uh, depending on weather and floral sources. So here in this past September, October, the bees got almost nothing, even though the bloom wasn't bad. It was just cool enough and wet enough that uh, I fed some of my bees like 80 pounds of supplementary feed in order to provide enough for them to get through the winter. And so it was a lot of supplementary feeding. Last year, I kept saying, this is the worst I've ever seen for forage. And then I got to this fall, and it was just tremendously um, shorter coming. So anyway, we can correct for that as far as feeding either a sugar water syrup or a corn syrup supplement, just depending on what you're more willing to use and have access to. 
even if their honey stores are coming short. Everything I do is about keeping my bees alive, and so uh, to get them through winter, that's what we will do if necessary when they don't store enough to make that likely. But in the winter, uh, if you're keeping bees, don't expect to see anything really. Uh, if I have my bees on your property, like these in the upper right hand of this slide, then they are just sitting there uh, cuddling basically, eating and clustered in order to maintain a temperature between 70 and 95 degrees, depending on what they're doing, and don't come out unless it gets over 40 or 45 or so degrees. So. If you're changing fence, for example, it's a good time to go out and do it around the bees because they are not coming out uh, or defending their area whatsoever. All right, and so as far as what most people are worried about, you see these people in the lower right hand, one with uh, you know, a bee beard and one with a bee beard slash bee bra combination. Uh, you know, <laughs> people will have varying levels of comfort. And uh, as far as when you can expect to have more trouble, um, Cheryl and Susan were saying they're in late May when they've got their linden basswood tree in bloom. That seems to set them off. But it's especially spring and in fall when you're likely to have more bees that don't know what to do other than look around for some sort of forage and not necessarily find it. And when they can't find it easily is when they become more dispensive, hungrier, and um, might might seem what is to you more temperamental, defensive, aggressive, whatever word you want to use. And so it's all dependent uh, on the season they're in. Like in July, I'll go stand out in the middle of thousands of bees flying around. And without protection, it does not matter. Whereas if it's October and they can't find food because uh, the goldenrod isn't yielding for whatever reason, they may be less friendly. And uh, I would want to wear protection. So everything is variable. That's part of the reality and part of why it's not certain that everyone wants to keep them. So let's go through some of the specifics. Here in the water sources, uh, one reason that it's nice to have a water source within a quarter mile or so is because you can control what they're going to do. It's kind of nice to have them here where they're in one of the natural locations on the top, either a puddle as in the upper left or on a pond with that green growth in the upper right, uh, and then you know they're not conflicting with any other animal or person. Whereas in the bottom half of the slide, what you see is here they're at a livestock trough and they're looking for water. And then on the right hand side, you see they're in a bird bath. And so if they do not have a significant water source nearby, it's more likely they will seek these kinds of opportunities. Uh, including neighbors' pools if you're in a suburban or a rural area where someone happens to have a pool of one sort or another. And so a nearby water source will help alleviate that. And it is interesting up here in the upper left is that their preferred water source is actually these kind of what you would consider murky, unpleasant sources. And uh, But the reason I suspect that is is because the water tends to be warmer in those areas. And so it doesn't cool down their little bodies so quick if that's what they're doing versus you know going into the middle of a river and sneaking a drink of some kind. So as far as um, if you've got these bees, what are they doing from season to season? Uh, it uh, is really seasonal as far as in the early spring, the tree pollen is what gets things rolling signals to the bees to raise new brood or, or offspring, these female worker bees. It's particularly the willow maple and to some extent the ash that get that going. And then as you get further into the spring, you have the typical sequence going through your fruit trees uh, of all varieties. Dandelions are an outstanding honey pollen source. I mean, for all the people who battle them in their yard, uh, I support you 1,000% for not killing them with something or other because they are outstanding, outstanding build up um, flowers for bees. And then uh, black locusts also are often viewed as undesirable because of their thorns, but they've got really lovely blossoms that can yield quite high nectar particularly rather than pollen in late May. And then as you get a little bit slightly later on, that's when you're in your linden basswood period. So those are the spring and early trees that matter for the bees especially. And then as you get into the main honey season, 
It's, uh, again, basically weeds <laughs> and crops that uh, in your typical yard, some people do not tolerate Dutch clover. It's an outstanding honey plant. Sweet clover, which is often viewed as a, an invasive weed uh, for, by some farmers. Sweet clover is outstanding, especially the white variety is when the nectar flow tends to strike most strongly, which is a little bit after the yellow sweet clover, which can be good, but it's not quite hot enough sometimes for it to yield well when yellow is in bloom versus white. Bird's foot trefoil, which is a low-growing yellow blossom, uh, it's especially used by the DOT in replanting. So uh, if there's one thing I like about the DOT, it's the use of trefoil. And then soybeans, which sounds completely unromantic and not tasty, actually yield a mild, light colored honey that is relatively pleasant. And so while you'll never ever see soybean honey labeled in the store, it is valuable and relatively tasty. And um, really your concern, I suppose, is on the GMO pollen content front if you are someone who follows that. And then when it comes to fall, as far as sources, the uh, goldenrod is I have in the upper right hand. Okay, and so this is one location that I have that uh, we see all kinds of goldenrod. It can be very thick in its stands and it's a very durable kind of flower. And also, again, seen as invasive, invasive species by some folks, but um, very good honey plant given the right conditions. And then more ornamental and native, the cone flower can yield something. Although cone flowers don't have anywhere near the kind of reliable yield that uh, goldenrod and some other things do. Okay, and so that's kind of taking you through the cycle of what beekeepers think about the relationship between, uh, you know, hosting them, what to keep an eye on during seasons, and then as far as if you are hosting them or keeping them yourself, depending on what scale you're doing this. Here I've got the evidence of how I operate. In the upper right hand, you see, you know, my flatbed truck, you know, my modest 1995 Ford uh, piled up with single hives and uh, for transportation in early springtime. So basically what I'm saying is I need room in order to take that in and out and uh, you know level ground with some protection around it is what I'm looking for most of the time. I happen to have a two-wheel drive truck because I'm extra cheap if 1995 wasn't enough to convince you of that. And then the lower right hand the swinger or basically articulated loader down there that's common in beekeeping sometimes we need to pull around a trailer with that thing if we're doing particular pollination activities if you're somebody who has an orchard or something and you want bees to come in and then leave uh, for whatever treatment you may use if you use treatments uh, sometimes we just have to consider access with a trailer and so all of this stuff you have to consider if you are hosting them with somebody who has a lot of bees like we do. But for most people, and especially if you're keeping your own bees on somewhere between 2 and 20 hives, it really doesn't matter because you'll find a way. But uh, it, as far as who you're working with, it's useful to keep these things in mind. So, I mean, no, that's an overview of the, the beekeeping, but it actually gets more specific than that. And so if you look here where I've taken you on the display right here, there are actually a number of varieties of honeybees. And this may seem bizarre. And so maybe we can start here. In the lower right hand is just a simple graphic showing the different types of bees. The, the one that the arrow is closest to there in the lower right is a drone. That's a male bee. They are unfertilized eggs. And they are bumbling buffoons that do nothing but fertilize queens if they can find them and then they die if they're successful. It's quite depressing really. As a guy I can say that. And then here we've got our queen which is um, longer and uh, in both in appendages and abdomen. Uh, basically the abdomen here is just a center for egg production. And so in the summertime she can lay 15, 1,500 eggs per day and uh, and she eats mm, two or three times her own body weight every day in order to achieve that, which is quite remarkable. And then our usual worker bee, which is female, uh, she is basically uh, neuter in, in practice because she never reproduces unless a queen is absent for a really long time. And so here we can see some of the different varieties 
that also affect landowner experience. And so depending on what kinds of bees you have, and I'm not trying to tell you to learn what species exist or subspecies really is the proper way to put it. They're all honeybees, but they have different strains. Uh, I'm not trying to ask you to learn what they are and to ask prospective beekeepers or if you select your own bees to learn every single trait, but just to be aware of variety because different producers of Carniolans, different producers of Italians, and different producers of Russians will all have different characteristics. And so uh, if you've got somebody who has really nice bees or somebody who has really mean bees, what I just want you to know is that there are options. Here up here with my Carniolan, which is most of what I use, it's a darker bee that's more winter hardy and that's why I use it because I don't ship my bees to Texas or California uh, to avoid the winter. Whereas, uh, But it's a nice bee and produces well. Whereas this Italian bee is very Mediterranean uh, in its habits, doesn't store as much food for winter, is very kind. And then down here, a recent import to um, battle parasites that I'll present to you later on uh, the Russian, it is far less reliable in its traits and just because it's been less consistently bred essentially is the way that I look at it and uh, they don't cross well if you cross a Russian with just about anything the second or third generation will be brutally mean is my experience although it's not the case in every instance and so um, when it comes to the bees themselves they vary and then when it comes to the people to come over here diverse personalities interests uh, it's remarkable how people are not the same in how they look at bees, having bees on their property. Cheryl and Susan have shared with me that they've got a neighbor that's not uh, overwhelmingly enthusiastic about having bees nearby, which is understandable and even instinctive. But um, as far as what people are up to, if you've got a lot of traffic, if you've got a lot of heavy equipment, those are things that are more likely to attract the bees attention and to make them suspicious of vibration and that kind of thing and so if these are your immediate neighbors it just depends on your relationship because I've had all kinds of situations where some folks are like um, this is my property I will do what I want it's part of my livelihood and so having bees is just part of that and everyone needs to deal with it others are afraid of somebody accusing them of having an insect which they could be allergic to and wanting to avoid any kind of liability. And then there are others who are themselves afraid and don't really want them nearby, but they'll put them in a back 40 somewhere and, and just feel good about what they're gaining and what is available for the bees and beekeeper as well. So people vary so much. Just be aware. Uh, and it's good to talk and ask uh, if you're thinking about it to see what the reactions might be. And then as far as the bees and how this goes, uh, I already got into the strain and breeder that these can vary. Beekeepers are also highly variable in how they're able to take care of them, the methods that they use. And so if you have a sister queen to some other queen and you have two different beekeepers, one who knocks things about and one who is very gentle and measured in how they handle things, the bees will react differently. And that has an effect for a couple hours, especially after they've been disturbed. If you've got somebody who really rouses them, then the bees aren't going to settle down very soon, uh, whereas you can imagine the opposite as well. And then all of it is dependent on conditions. You know, if it's cool and wet, they will be less friendly than if it's warm and flowers everywhere. And so things aren't perfectly consistent on that front. Okay. And so let's have a look. And this is especially thinking about people who might want to keep their own bees, about what you would need to look into in order to uh, just house them and handle them. So when it comes to top bottom boxes, foundation for them to build wax upon, uh, which is just a sheet with a template with the hexagons on it, and then the wooden frames that hold that sheet, uh, that will wind up getting uh, toward a couple hundred dollars by the time you have enough of those kinds of things at a minimum to handle everything. And then the bees themselves, uh, if you buy a package of bees, I'll show you a picture here in a second, or a nuke, which it means nucleus hive, or an established hive that survived the winter, uh, that, that starts to get quite pricey. And that the package bees tend to be around $90 right now for three pounds of bees, which is about 12,000 bees. Nukes are a little bit bigger, and they already have uh, an established queen and a bunch of bees 
and so they can be more like 120 to 40. And then when you get into the full-size hives, then you're looking more at uh, 150 or more. And so basically the more mature your situation, the more expensive it gets. We handle them all. But um, as far as what we typically sell, we, we handle thousands of package bees. And so what this winds up being is a box of bees that has screen wire on the sides. And each one of these wooden boxes is a package. Okay, and so they come in two pound, three pound, or four pound, and it's about 40 ton, 4,200 bees per pound. And uh, so uh, you can look in the Iowa abuzzaboutbees.com website for the Iowa honey producers. They advertise various suppliers in different areas, and we also at eberhoney.com we also have a package page that shows you where to locate various sizes and costs too. And so we, we bring through a few thousand of those in the springtime. Whereas a more mature option, which depends on survival and development, are these. These are mini hives that I've got listed. And so they are um, basically a half a box of bees, four frames or so. And they've got established queens. And here I am a few years ago going through some of my early nukes or nucleosides again is what nukes is. First times I ever started hearing nukes it was like well are they going to blow up next? I don't quite get it. Okay and then other things that you would need is of course um, people vary in how much protective clothing they want and uh, that uh, there in the lower left you see myself when I'm trying to go through things quickly I do wear the protection whereas if I have one hive in the yard I'm just going to pop in and check it out and then I might just wear the veil or a hat or something, so it just varies on how much I'm doing and how quickly I'm doing it, how much protective clothing I use. And uh, you don't see a smoker in this picture, but smokers are useful. It really calms down the bees. Uh, they just eat food instead of reacting and being defensive. And then depending on how many bees you have, in order to extract the honey into a liquid form and put it into bottles, um, there are lower cost options that can wind up only a few hundred dollars. but uh, uh, you know, just the scale and whether you get new or used is is kind of key in how much all of this costs. You can start up for a thousand dollars or much less, depending if you get new or used. We've been we we started out used, of course. Uh, we we've been through every phase, as I'll show you, with from two to a thousand, and so we we did everything on cash flow and low cost, and now we've gotten established enough that we can buy some stuff instead of only you know begging people for things. But uh, as far as the bees themselves and how happy they are, you know, here's some nectar sources and pollen sources, but particularly nectar, I guess, is what's on this slide. Orchards really get things going. And so down here in the lower left, you see apple blossoms. They're lovely. They make me happy every day. And this is an Italian bee. Even though I mostly have carniolans, I think the Italian bees are especially pretty here on the apple flowers. So that's why I put that one up. And then uh, black locust. As I said, those thorny trees that a lot of people don't like, but they make good posts. Basswood linden, which is kind of a moderate between hardwood and softwood, that's uh, that's a good tree native and has tons of blossoms in late May, early June. And then here, uh, down to the lower right, and there we've got uh, Dutch clover, which is the villain of many people's town yards, but my best friend, I love Dutch clover. And uh, I don't have a picture of tree foil, that low growing yellow flower that I was talking about earlier. But here's a bee who's happily siphoning some nectar while carrying on her pollen sacs a big load of pollen from something yellow. And so, uh, so there are some pictures of where they do their best at certain times. Okay, And then soybeans, as I mentioned, they can be good. It's only like one every three or four years we get much yield off soybeans. But um, I just like people to understand that they're not irrelevant if you're going for a honey crop. Aside from other GMO issues, uh, they can yield honey. OK. But uh, whether you're dealing with somebody who's keeping bees on your property or if you are thinking of keeping them yourself, one of the major topics to be aware of is the need to address certain situations. And what I've got listed here first is, uh, in terms of images and text both, is the Varroa mite. And so this is a fuzzy little creature that jumps from a different bee species in Southeast Asia onto 
our common European style honeybee in the late 80s and migrated around the world very quickly. And uh, you can see here that they basically fasten onto the underbody of developing bees and weaken them. These are male bees. They love the male bees because they are developing for 28 days rather than 21 days. So these parasites just love them beyond belief and they produce more times on them as a result of the late longer period. And then here's the close up of the blood sucker. I use, uh, I haven't got this on a slide, but I use a thymol organic product to kill them and, uh, and control the population. We are working on genetic selection in order to achieve a you know, more sustainable and less treatment dependent management of varroa. But uh, that's the reality of what we're facing at the moment is I use a thymol derivative in order to manage it. And, and there are other people who use like, uh, well, it's outdated in some ways to say, but Maverick or Tactic, I guess, is more current. Um, basically agrochemicals which are not FDA approved for use in this way. And so that always worries me, but we use an organic option. Uh, let's see, you need to provide enough food if they are short for whatever reason. And so that's one reason I put this winter picture here, down here in the lower right. And so sugar syrup is basically the most common mix that people would use. 50-50 is a really good one for winter. And then coming down here to diseases to be aware of and learn about, there are various viruses which you can't really control. There are bacteria called foul brood that you can treat and detect. And then there are fungi that are more common when it's wet in spring than later on. You don't really have to treat for them. And so, um, but, but, but you need to be able to recognize what they are. That's kind of the key. Okay, and so here we are. Uh, put them wherever you can. So this is a fairly open location here around my arrow in the lower right. And we actually don't have bees there this past couple of years, but I really liked it because the snow completely blew over these hives, as you can see. Not blew them over like knocked over, but drifted over. And you can see that they melted out about four inches just by heat around the hives. And so what I want you to understand is that bees don't suffocate under the snow. It's actually outstanding insulation. And then I just came along and uncovered them when I wanted to check and see if they had enough food in February. And uh, I've got feeders down here along the sides that I can give them 10 or 12 pounds of feed at a time if they need something more to get by. All right. Um, if you do keep bees, understand that your experience will be different if you've got a bunch of them as I've got here in the right hand side where I've got about 20 over here. It's a little bit under that. About 20 in this area. And these are black locust trees also that are in bloom, although you can't really tell in the picture. And uh, you'll notice there's a soybean field over here. There's a hay field behind them. So they are in the midst of agriculture. And uh, I just wanted to show you that it's possible to keep bees in not ideal conditions. And so I've had I had them there for a couple of years. This year there were soybeans all around them, which means late July, August, aphid killing. And since they were completely surrounded, I was like, I, I'm getting them out of there. But when there was just one soybean field, I left them there for a while. Um, but um, as if you've got more bees, they may rob from one another. When you get into the fall, uh, they get quite vicious, I guess, uh, the stronger ones versus the weaker ones. So you can watch for that. Um, they will have lower yields if there's 20 hives in a location versus a few. And uh, if you do get alarm pheromone, which is a banana smelly nest uh, that gets on you if a bee is ever terrified or angry. And uh, so that's something that will signal to other hives as you move along that you are not to be trusted. And so uh, it won't last from day to day, but within minutes and within minutes it will be detectable. And then it's uh, completely unknown uh, as far as moving in what each individual is up to as far as beekeeper landowner activity. What will beekeepers act like? What will the landowners act like? What's going on in each particular location? This particular yard, you know, all that happened is that there was harvesting equipment and enclosed cabs that went around them a couple times a year, planting and harvesting. So there's no real nearby disturbance. And so didn't have to worry about much there. OK, but the reality is that most people are scared of getting stung. And so here I've got a couple of pictures, cartoon variety on the one hand, and then the 
real one here with the sting in somebody's hand from a worker bee. It is true that worker bees will die if they sting you, and so you've got a little bit of vengeance if you're ever angry at them. They're dead. Ha ha ha. And so, uh, but it's also sad. And it's suicidal and kamikaze and brutal in that way. And uh, but um, people are afraid, and so but just understand that bees are basically not aggressive in the sense that we understand it as far as evil intent or something. It's simply what triggers their defensiveness is really the way to look at it. And different bees are differ in what triggers that defensive behavior, and that's why I was talking about strains earlier. And so here, well, I guess that's not a good way to to transition. So I'll go back, but. Um, to understand that there are different seasons and different um, types of bees and the way you manage them will help you learn how to interact with them and so I'll just follow up with a little bit more on that in a little while but um, the big picture is also just what's happening with bees overall you know are they all doomed uh, colony collapse order or CCD is something that's been talked about since 2006 but um, as we've done more research, or scientists really, not myself, have done more research, they've begun to doubt that colony collapse disorder is a particular thing so much as a whole bunch of things going on at once. The varroa mites, which I pointed out earlier, those little orange critters that crawl around and suck the guts out of developing bees, uh, they communicate viruses and make bees more susceptible to viruses. Um, commercial beekeepers uh, often wind up using artificial feeds in terms of protein pollen and nectar uh, replacement with corn syrup and sugar syrup and so it's not a very natural or fortifying diet for some bees especially the ones that are tracked back and forth across the country and then in the meanwhile uh, here in the Midwest where we've got such an agro intensive setting uh, and uh, and also elsewhere including the Central Valley in California where a lot of bees go for their pollination of almonds uh, chemicals and how they interact with one another. That's what I mean by cocktail effect, is that chemicals act differently when they are combined at low levels than when they are on their own. And therefore, they are unstudied for the most part in these various levels in, in cocktails. And so that's something to just accept, I guess, that this is what's going on, but also to understand. So in Europe, they've banned neonicotinoids, for example, until they get further information. And so uh, there's been legislation on that end to say, we're not using these things until we figure out what's going on. And uh, related to that idea is that uh, when it comes to engineered crops, uh, pollens, the protein sources, are variable and could be even poisonous in some situations. And in the midst of it all, uh, are on the beekeeping side, queen production has become very commercial. And so if I order, for example, 100 hives to be delivered on April 15th or something, they could well all be sisters. And so there's a genetic diversity issue that could be playing into all of this. All right. Um, but um, and, and also, I don't like to like let beekeepers off the hook, is that beekeepers um, who wind up with dead bees all, often will blame something rather than themselves. People are like this, right? And so, uh, you know, if they starved, they might just say, oh, it's colony collapse disorder. And like, no, you just didn't make sure they had enough food. And so, um, uh, I mean, we have to accept responsibility. And so if you take up keeping bees or you're interacting with the beekeeper, if they all wind up dead year after year, it's probably not some bizarre thing. It's probably an issue with the with the person. But um, as far as if things don't go well, here is a common issue. You know, what if I get stung? Am I allergic? And so here on the right-hand side, this was a, this is not a picture of myself, but it reminds me of myself. I couldn't find the picture. Uh, a few years ago, I got stung like this on the lip, and the lip swells like crazy if you don't get stung very often. And so there's the disaster of the lip swelling, and um, it varies between person, age. And uh, like younger people with really tender skin tend to swell up a lot. It doesn't mean they're allergic, though. Uh, not truly allergic, like anaphylactic, as I'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, because swelling, that's not a problem. It happens in about uh, you know a fifth of the population, between the tenth and a fifth of the population, huge swelling. But it also depends where you get stung. Uh, the face, especially, is where you get a lot of a lot of swelling. 
and then anaphylaxis that's where it's like oh no I can't breathe I'm going to die I mean really I'm going to die uh, and that's more like one percent so most of the people who say they are allergic they mean that they swell a lot and are scared but there are legitimately people who can wind up in a hospital and in need of a shot adrenaline shot in order to avoid anaphylaxis and so what I'm saying is that I'm often skeptical of people who say they're truly allergic when they really just swell a lot in ways that they feel are hideous but it doesn't mean that they're in mortal danger in all cases but some people truly are and so just uh, to close the presentation side I'll a couple of things about myself uh, and, and the bees is that we've been through all phases as I said we went from two hives to a thousand over the past 35 years and so um, it's been step by step and we understand everything about hobbyist everything about moderate commercial size because we did it all we've just gradually been moving through all of this I love the honeycomb this is kind of root beer flavored uh, looking but um, it's just a dark honey and uh, we market under the pure Iowa honey uh, label in a few central Iowa locations and then here's me and uh, I do a uh, job teaching European history at Mount Mercy University as part of my daytime life uh, summer I'm keeping bees all of the time and selling stuff but um, here's a presentation I did a couple of years ago but um, I took this up on the beekeeping side when I was still in high school drove around illegally I hope there's a statute of limitations on that uh, you know I just went around and took care of bees uh, despite not having a license because I really liked it and my dad had another job so that's what I did and if you want to check out anything else uh, you can go to these links for either my periodically and by periodically I mean like every few months sometimes updated bee blog and then our our, our website there and there's a whole bunch of cut comb down here honeycombs people are starting to love that more than when they once did uh, in the past few years although older people have kept after it now the younger generation seems to be wondering what it is and how it tastes and so um, I hope that was helpful uh, about uh, the beekeeper side the potential beekeeper side if you want to take it up and then a little bit about our specific angle so that's everything I have so we can move along with uh, questions or anything Liz or Jake might want to direct us toward too okay. thanks Adam um, I want to say, Cheryl and, and Susan, if you guys want to follow up on anything Adam said about, um, you know, your situation or how you guys got started with this or um, how often you get stung, um, you know, feel free to jump in too. And anybody in the chat box, feel free to ask questions of either Adam or Cheryl or Susan. So you can get the real truth on how well Adam takes care of his bees out of their place. I'll just say that, um, you know, that the bees are really are very calm and I'm not afraid of them. I mow around the hives. They only, I, I have been stung just a couple of times, but it has been when I'm working near the linden trees that are in bloom. Um, and usually it's more by mistake than them. Uh, being ornery, you know, you don't pay attention and you put your glove on or take it off or something and it disturbs one that you didn't know was you know, crawling on your arm or something. Um, and then the other thing I was going to mention too is that the first year that we had them right there by the hoop house, I would notice that they would get inside the hoop house and not be able to get out and then some of the bees would die and that was real upsetting to me I did not like seeing that they were dying because of us so um, what we did is our hoop house has the sides that roll up and down and in we went inside the hoop house and put netting up in that space where the roll-up sides are and having that netting there really decreased the amount of bees that we would see come into the hoop house and mm -hmm. be able to figure out how to get back out yeah uh it's true that if bees get into a kind of translucent transparent kind of material they don't brighten up about 
I need to seek an alternative exit and they'll just beat themselves against the plastic and wind up dead and so it's nice that you took some measures to try and help them out on that front and uh, in your case when I was talking about location and how proximate they were to things going on you've got this greenhouse that's like you know 20 yards away or something it's quite nearby and your house is just beyond that and so I mean you're very tolerant and constructive in working with them and, and talking to other people if they've got a problem whereas other folks aren't necessarily and so that kind of build on the discussion of what people want for themselves and how to support it and so oh was there another question that I may not have answered it seems like I may have missed one there's a few questions Maybe not. on the chat box if you want to take a look at those Ah, oh, there are a few. Okay, let's see. Somebody was asking about swarming and how safe or not it is. Bees are actually uh, dead gentle when they are swarming. When you just find this cluster hanging somewhere, they're full of food uh, that they're carrying with them to take to their new place to build wax, and they're very gentle. And so you can literally just shake them into a box or something and uh, start a new hive that way with very little threat of stinging if you've got some kind of minimal protection and so while it's terrifying for most people to be like oh um, there's 10 or 20,000 bees hanging in a tree but you literally just give them a shake or two and as long as the queen goes in the box they're going to be in there and you can start a new hive pretty easy and so uh, it's, it, it, it may be quite scary to look at but they're very malleable and fairly friendly uh, really by friendly I mean they ignore you <laughs> and uh, and so that's good as far as if that ever comes around and uh, let's see uh, what else have we got here so swarms liability concerns um, I was talking about this with an orchard owner who um, has people come around to buy all kinds of pet things whether it's the uh, cider or the apples themselves or pies and what he found when he was talking to his insurance person is if this is related to your livelihood particularly then there's no concern about uh, liability if somebody is stung and, and harmed in a way that just didn't work with their system because you can't be um, held liable for conducting a legal occupation that doesn't cooperate with somebody else's system and so that's the that's the way it was I went over it with somebody here recently although I can't say that it was an agent from a particular insurance agency who was telling me that it's more secondhand so I wouldn't put it down as the official story but that's the most recent way I've heard it discussed and uh, and it's the same for people who are trucking bees around that they go up and down the highways and they have to think about this so they've got nets and they make reasonable precautions but you know if somebody goes and sticks their hands in something and gets stung it's not something that you tend to be held uh, liable for uh, let's see um, how far would we personally travel we only go about 25 miles from our location so Linville near Grinnell we go about 30 mile radius from there and it's the same for me here in the Mount Vernon uh, Solon area I go about 25 mile radius from there and just so you don't spend all your time driving and uh, let's see we are first time wannabe owners oh I love it suggestions for Michigan purchases um, hmm let's see Michigan actually I don't know Michigan what I would suggest is getting in touch with your uh, Michigan Beekeepers Association so if you search for a state association uh, beekeeping in Michigan you'll almost certainly get a good hit and they probably have a newsletter that will list people who will deliver in April and May package bees and also nukes in May or early June and so that would be an easy way to try and find suppliers and uh, let's see um, when, can we go back to the liability issue? Just so, just to let people know, we did have a, a homeschool field trip come out to the farm, and oh, yeah. we warned them ahead of time that there were bees, and if anyone was allergic, then they should take precaution or not come. And everybody uh, was totally fine with that. There was no issue. 
that's the great idea is to provide notice so that it is uh, you know a choice rather than surprise I've got bees here and you happen to get stung and have an adverse consequence so yeah that's a great way it's basically inserting a disclaimer and and choice on behalf of the person who is putting themselves in the situation so yeah thanks for sharing that that's a really good solution Uh, let's see. As far as discuss how you know when the bees are getting enough food, is it seasonal or is there something you are observing? Uh, this is definitely experience related, is that I can look in hives and be able to tell if the combs are a certain thickness, if they've got caps on them, if they're storing enough honey. And, uh, and I can also just lift the hive, kind of tilt it, grab it by one of the handholds in the back and lift it up to see how much it weighs. And uh, you know, essentially to get through the winter, for example, you want them between 120 or so pounds or a little bit more. And I can kind of feel it uh, rather than scaling them, although you can get a scale, a spring scale, to weigh one side at a time if you're not confident about that. And so uh, it is something you can measure, but you get a feel for as you keep bees to just look. And so uh, that's part of beekeeping experience versus uh, you know just wondering. And uh, when it comes to having the arrangement with different landowners, it is true. It's more of a handshake situation. We have no documentation. Uh, instead, we are uh, just going to have informal agreements, it's true, what you would call informal, where we just have a verbal agreement. That may not be the smartest situation now that you bring it up, but um, that's uh, uh, how we operate. We just have friendly agreements with landowners for a little corner of their land, and that's how we how we wind up. Because, uh, you know, Cheryl and Susan, we didn't consult a lawyer and sit down and sign our names in blood or anything. It's just, uh, you know, I've got bees, you've got land, we could mutually benefit, and uh, the bees need some help, and so that's how we set it up. Mm. Um, how, how might they find someone near you? Ah, good point. Uh, so to find someone near you, uh, there are, I mean, several ways that you could pursue. I was just promoting for the Michigan people the idea of getting in contact with the state organization because most of the state organizations have a public website with officers that you can contact uh, and they can point you toward a list or certain individuals. And so if you're, and so in the Iowa case, it's a buzzaboutbees.com, that's the Iowa honey producers, and you know, they list their officers and everything. But there are also more local beekeeping societies like uh, here in the uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City area, you would go through the uh, Eastern Iowa Beekeepers Association that meets down in Coralville. There in the Ames area, um, a lot of people go down to the DMAC area and do the Central Iowa Beekeepers Association. So there's lots of associations is what I'm suggesting is that you just search for associations on Google and you can probably find officers and localities that can suit you or if you can't get that narrow even the state association could be really helpful but um, as far as um, just looking around there are also ways that if you're fairly independent and you can read on your own through just determination that uh, there are beekeeping businesses that supply package bees that can be shipped through the post service or UPS depending on the particular place. Most of them are either in California, um, Texas, or the southeast. Basically places that are warmer sooner than it is here because they get higher bee populations and they ship off some of those bees in April, May up to us. And so that's a way to get hold of bees if you just want to contact somebody in one of those regions uh, as well. Any other question? Hey Adam, there was a question in a different block about wrapping the bees. We don't wrap them. Someone asked how we wrap them for the winter. So maybe you might want to touch on covering them up for the winter. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm just finishing that right now. Thankfully, it's been less brutal than the beginning of last winter, although it was scary for a while uh, there in November. But uh, what we do is we've got two different things. One is a, a fiberglass quilt 
um, plastic covered and then fiberglass foam and we can staple that on the outside and then we put some uh, insulation board uh, just a kind of R board kind of thing that's porous on top and that does two things or three things even one is it's black plastic and so it tracks heat and the insulation itself of course helps hold it closer to the hives and then on top the porous insulation board lets the water from the bees respiration to work through the board instead of beating up on the ceiling and dripping back down on them in a cold winter and so that helps them from having to fight so hard to stay healthy and alive and uh, then another option instead of doing the insulation wrap is to put a carton over them a corrugated cardboard or corrugated plastic carton over them which is also black and that helps uh, attract the heat here in our midwestern winters and uh, provide some blockage for any holes you may have in used equipment or something and so we either use corrugated cartons or the fiberglass style of colony quilt uh, in order to insulate them and help them along Um, any experience with mason bees? Are they local? If we build shelter, what will they come? Uh, I have no experience with mason bees. Uh, you can also keep bumblebees if you want. Uh, the main thing about the conventional honeybees and why people keep them is that they are the only variety of bee that gathers uh, tremendous surpluses of honey. And so while there are some smaller bee varieties you may want for specific pollination purposes. Um, it's also the case that uh, what we call honeybees, this particular species, Apis mellifera and the various substrains, uh, they are the only one that is hugely prolific in terms of crop, uh, honey and wax, and they also have very large populations for population uh, or pollination purposes, and so that's why they are the primary commercial pollinator that gets trucked around to uh, cranberries, blueberries, almonds, melons, and that kind of thing. So I, I'm afraid I don't know anything about mason bees, uh, just to be as clear as day about that particular question. Um, someone else asked, uh, how often you visit your locations to assess the hives and um, to give advice? Oh, OK. And so let's see. When it is about visiting locations, people, beekeepers vary in that. I come every two to four weeks, <laughs> and so that's kind of a medium frequency. Uh, how often I come depends on the weather, how quickly they're developing, how much floral source and heat there are to push them along, and so it fluctuates based on those conditions. But um, when it comes to advice, uh, you pretty much have to call me. And uh, if you live nearby, I may come over. But uh, uh, as far as hosting bees of your own that you have established yourself, that's mostly something that I do by uh, phone call rather than actually visiting. But we do have in Iowa a state APRS named Annie Joseph. And if you want him, to actually come to your bees wherever you are, he will generally do that if it's not something that can be handled by phone. So we do have that resource through state funding to have a state APRS to come to you. Um, whether you have your own bees or you decide to host the bees, it's up to the landowner, as far as I understand this, to register with the sensitive crop or as an um, apiary, and they must then, once you are registered and that property is on the registry, then any commercial spraying that's done, they must contact you and they must, you know, they are aware that the bees are there. And I think, I don't know how many times I've been called and they'll say, we're going to spray, this is when, this is where. And generally, they've always been far enough away. They don't affect us, but they still call. And I think that's um, a really good heads up for anyone, even if you're just going to host the bees, you should still register on that. 
Yeah, we do have a site that was developed a few years ago for registration purposes. I, I really thank you for bringing that up because uh, as we got into the Lohr's bandage was kind of the chemical that was super lethal to bees whenever it was applied when beans were in bloom. That was kind of when there was more pressure even before the neonicotinoids came around uh, to you know, at least make people aware of when applications were going to happen. And so, as Cheryl's saying, uh, registration of the location through, I think it's an IDALS, I-D-A-L-S site that allows you to uh, put in your location so that you have to be notified if it's within a mile of your location if something is being applied, especially when a crop is in bloom. And so that keeps everybody aware, allows you to take countermeasures uh, if it's appropriate to try and protect them, like putting a wet sheet over them so that they can't fly in and out, move them physically to another location so they're not subject to the treatment or drift. And uh, uh, Sharon Susan's location is great in that they've got a lot of CRP and some timber there in the vicinity in an organic operation anyway. So I don't have to worry about their place. But as I showed in the picture in the presentation, I've also got a few locations where the soybean field is next door. And, uh, uh, and so I need to be much more aware of it in those cases especially. Yeah, thank you guys for bringing that up. Um, we work on pesticide drift at Tractor Farmers. And I, I put the link to the sensitive crops directory from IDALS in the chat box. Um, you do need to, if you're listed on there, renew your registration every year uh, or you fall off the list. Um, and also, there was a, an update to the regulation. So currently, they don't have to contact you. Uh, they do have to send the list, but they don't have to contact you. Um, but a lot of them, as good practice, will do so anyway. So um, it's a good idea to just stay in touch with um, the co-ops and farmers around you about that, um, but just, just wanted to make that note. So. Uh, thanks, yeah. Things have evolved over the past few years, and uh, people tend to be actually really good about notifications, I have found and been pleased to uh, experience that if there's an application coming, then even farmers who I've not necessarily met, I mean, let alone the applicators, but sometimes the farmers who are, you know, the next country block down may well find my phone number and give me a call just to let me know. And so, uh, I don't know, that's just kind of a yay Iowa moment, I think. <laughs> it's just a nice thing to do. <laughs> so there was another question about, have you ever experienced theft of a hive from your yard or off-site? Oh, yeah, I see that now. Uh, I have not personally, that, or they got away with it scot-free. I didn't notice. <laughs> but um, it is true that it happens. And so I do have one friend who's down in the West Liberty area, and he's got uh, a number of hives, 20 or 30, I think, and he had eight or 10 of them stolen just this last spring. And uh, Part of what's been going on is the bees have become harder to keep alive and honey supplies have gotten shorter is that it's driven up the prices on everything, whether it's the equipment that you keep them in, the bees that you have in them, or the honey that you produce from them. It's all gotten much more expensive. And so uh, there has been some bee theft. Well, what I've heard about has particularly been in the Iowa-Illinois border area rather than elsewhere in Iowa as far as I know. And, uh, but it can occur on a large scale in places that are especially commercially active. And so out in California, where there is uh, the almond pollination that brings in millions of hives, a couple million hives, uh, they can have actually truckloads of hives that are stolen because all it takes is a, you know, a bobcat with forks on the front end and a flatbed trailer and you can take off with 400 hives in less than an hour. So. Um, it is possible to have them stolen. It occurs on a small scale here in our area, but um, there aren't enough commercial large-scale folks for it to be a major threat on, as far as you know, stealing semi-loads at a time or anything like that. So there's another question about um, whether or not your hives have suffered bee losses the last couple of years. Mm. That's a uh, 
basically true, but not as bad as what we've heard from, you know, certain people who have lost like 80 or 90 percent of their hives between the 2006 and 10 period especially. And so the stories uh, are that, see, one thing is that I like became self-aware in the post late 1980s and the varroa mite that I was pointing out to you came into the picture in the very late 1980s. And so I've never known beekeeping where we didn't have a pretty vicious parasite that weakened them significantly. And so the stories before my time are that it was fairly easy to have thriving bees and to get 90 plus percent of them to live through the winter in the Midwest. And so as for ourselves, we accept that we are going to lose at least 10 percent of our hives and pretty likely 25 to 30 percent of our hives in a normal winter. And that is not something that's crippling because the survivors, what you can do is you can take part of the surviving hive, put it in a new box with a new queen, and then you get two hives for one basically, or even three hives for one, depending on how strong it is. And so you can recover from a 25 to 40 percent loss without needing to buy a bunch of bees from one of these warm weather areas. But um, I mean, has it increased dramatically in the past 10 years or something? No, not really. Uh, but um, this last winter was pretty hard uh, just because it was so long and cold and so the bees would, when it gets really cold they often move to the top of the hive because they hit basically a wall so it reflects the heat back down on them and they like it. But the bad news is they, if they eat all of the food they can't go up anymore to more food. Instead they can hit the ceiling and not have anywhere to go and just freeze or starve one or the other and so uh, as far as the wide-scale deaths that have occurred in the past several years we haven't seen a dramatic increase but it is definitely harder to keep bees now than it was 50 years ago from all accounts and that's probably one reason why we have you know half as many bees today as we did in 1950 in Iowa uh, although there are also forage issues as we've gone from well, it's not really fence row to fence row anymore since a lot of the fences have been taken out, but you know what I mean, that there's less diverse landscape, and so that is a factor, but uh, it's also just more difficult, and uh, some people seem to be lucky or do things well without knowing why and uh, keep them alive from year to year without having been a specialist in it. But uh, as for myself, having done it basically my whole life and on a large scale for shoot about 20 years now. I have to work pretty hard at keeping them alive. It's not something that uh, I can take for granted whatsoever. So I, have an, I have another question. I'm sort of curious um, how often you are looking for places to host bees and, and Cheryl and Susan, similar question, were you looking for someone to host bees before you ran into Adam at Laura's Field Day or was it something that you thought of, oh, that'd be a great idea sort of afterwards? Uh, yes, I'm curious about what Susan and Cheryl have to say about this. What? What's the question? Were we thinking about it before <laughs> field day? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I think when we heard about it, it was like, oh, that's a great idea, perfect. And you know, I, I don't think I would have thought about it without being at the field day. Without hearing someone's experience, because Laura told about her experience, and then there you were driving up in your red truck, and like, aha, I think I need a car. <laughs> I do love my red truck. <laughs> uh oh, I may have lost you. Are you still there? Yep, we're still here. Are you there? Okay, yep, I can hear again. Okay. So, and Adam, how often are you? But for, for new places, or um, how did you decide to take Cheryl and Susan on? Um, I mean, it was that simple that they um, followed up with me uh, after that field day, and so it wasn't in the moment, but they apparently talked and decided they would like to invite me over, and so then I went over to their place and we went through uh, the particular field where they were interested in having bees, and it looked good to me. And uh, as far as how often, though, that in general I'm looking, 
it is really dependent on how well my bees survive the winter and what increase I imagine making because it's true that I, I, I am gradually building up here in the eastern side of Iowa uh, kind of redoing what we did for the past 20 years as I moved to a different part of the state and my older brother came into the business where I was before and so I'm, uh, I'm aiming to rebuild uh, in the spring but as far as people who are interested in bees and uh, having myself or someone else come in to keep them on their location we usually do most of the populating of new locations in April and May particularly May is the big one and so if you want to line it up for any year you want it to happen uh, before May arrives because by the time July comes then we're usually in the middle of the honey crop and the bees aren't moving after that point and then it's a question of you know do they survive the winter are we splitting new hives off of the survivors or not so uh, um, as far as my sp specific case I'm uh, looking for contacts all of the time but uh, but uh, as far as general interest for people wanting bees on their land you want to have it organized for the upcoming spring because there are not many bees that you'll be able to move in during the middle of summer or fall or anything like that let's see I see a question also about what do you actually feed the bees in the lean months and that just depends on uh, both the time frame of when they look lean like individual hives if they look like they have eaten too much food uh, one reason we give supplementary feed is that the bees do not act all the same which is kind of disappointing of course it'd be easier if they all did exactly the same thing but some of them raise new bees in the middle of winter and others don't uh, because of population or variety of bee or whatever and so uh, the basic range of what you feed them uh, that you can choose from are sugar syrup where you just get the basic cane sugar and mix it with water or you can get corn syrup, um, bulk corn syrup and you can also do sugar patties uh, and so it's either a patty or some form of syrup is what you feed them in the lean months and in my case I also usually have 100 or 200 pounds of granulated honey that I can kind of scrape into a hive as well but if it's a really lean winter then that's not enough so there are several options some of them are I mean they're all able to be made by yourself in the sugar case corn syrup you have to buy obviously and uh, um, but you can also buy commercially prepared um, sugar patties too if it's not something you feel confident about getting the right consistency you can get them prepared from a few beekeeping supplies Oh, looks like this question, is there a reason why the bees can't be moved to a warm building or barn in the winter if one has only a few hives? Ah, okay. Yep, just scroll down. I see that now. The issue with warmth is that the bees won't stay inside their hive, and you need that in the winter. Because if they come out and get into an environment which they think is warm but is not actually warm they fly for a few seconds getting into the wider world and they fall to the ground dead or near enough to dead that they can't recover and will die shortly after so you actually need them to be at a fairly steady temperature and it is worthwhile if you have say a corn crib or a machine shed of some sort that gets them out of the wind and is more likely to provide more constant conditions I mean that's worth doing that makes life easier for them but uh, you know I guess an easy example is to say I'm, I want my hives to have an easy time so I'll put them in my basement where it's 60 degrees or something and that really won't work because they'll want to come out and uh, there's nothing for them to do and so they'll be quite active and come out of the hive and, and, and die everywhere instead of going through the winter securely which is counterintuitive but uh, you 
want them to have a winter experience actually in the Midwest as far as not being too warm or else they'll raise a bunch of bees, they'll be overactive and actually end up less likely to survive than if they're at say a constant 35 or 40 degrees or something. So one thing I've got a acquaintance up in Michigan, actually Wisconsin, um, who has a he bought an old cheese factory building that's a cinder block thing and uh, it's some kind of dank and cool and so it stays fairly steady temperatures you know if it one day goes up to 45 degrees all of a sudden it's still 30 something inside and so uh, just because of the way it's constructed he's able to provide consistent conditions that are very helpful for the bees to live whereas uh, if uh, and bees generate tremendous heat you have to understand and it's hard to understand unless you're used to them uh, that uh, if you say you put uh, 20 hives into a small room it will heat the place up and so it, it takes pretty special circumstances outside of a fairly open air corn crib kind of situation to not warm up to a way that could actually be damaging to them All right. well we are running out of time Cheryl and Susan do you have any last remarks you want to make not really, except we still do love the honey. Yay! <laughs> How much honey are you using every year? What was that, Liz? How much honey are you eating every year? Are we eating every year? Eating. Oh, getting. That's an Adam question, because I think that depends on what you're getting. Oh, that's... You know. Well, that's actually a good question as far as I know. I talked about the deal that there's generally a trade of honey for the space. And I mean, some people actually don't care. They don't want anything, but I give it to them anyway. But um, there are other people who love honey. And so I'm kind of on a working basis. Like most people, I just provide a variety. And so when Cheryl and Susan, I bring around their delivery somewhere between November and January. I bring them a mix of smaller containers, one or two bigger containers, a little bit of honeycomb, maybe some creamed honey, just a little bit of everything so that they can give some away, they can eat some. Uh, but it is also true that uh, when there are certain people who are really clear about what they like and they say, I want all the honey I can get for myself, I'm not giving it away, then I just bring you know, a 12 pound jug of honey at a time and have them contact me when they want more. And other people say, I actually don't really like honey, period, but I like to give away the little bears as gifts. So if you can bring me a couple of boxes around Christmas of 12 ounce bears so I can give them away to people, that would be great. Then I do that as well. So I'm kind of flexible on how I deliver the, the honey uh, to the particular person hosting the bees. Just depends on how much they like to eat versus give away and that kind of thing. And, and what they like even. Some people hate comb honey and others want it. So it, it, it varies from person and household to household. Uh, the, other, the other good thing about receiving honey from where you live or close to where you live is it's great for your um, allergies. Um, a really great health benefit, just not just eating delicious honey, but it's really good for um, your immune system and your allergy issues. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. The pollen grains. One of the common, it's not honey kind of news releases that's been coming out the past couple of years, especially, has been related to the ultra filtration processes that commercial packers use. And when I say commercial, I mean like millions of pounds packers, rather than people like me who do tens of thousands. And uh, uh, the difference is that the large-scale packers, they use a flash heating system that takes the honey up to about 180 degrees, which makes it very water-like. And so you can push it through high-pressure filters. And what that does is it takes out every single particle, uh, including the pollen bits, out of the honey. And that's what they say makes it no longer technically honey, because nectar turned into honey ought to contain some small amount of pollen. And uh, if that's not present, then obviously you're not getting the benefits that Susan's talking about as far as um, exposure to these uh, pollen granules that can cause reactions. But you can also get habituated, too, so that you don't have such reactions. 
And so um, that's one of the benefits of knowing your beekeeper and having a local source. We're going to have to do a follow-up farm hour to get through all, this, all the great things about this. But um, thank you guys so much for participating in this and to everyone um, listening in. Uh, this farm hour will be archived on the Practical Farmers Bible website. Um, so go there and you can grab the link and check it out whenever you want. And uh, that's, that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for setting this up, Liz. Really appreciate it. Good to hear from you, Cheryl and Susan, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, yep good.